I, mean, I think I think one one piece uh, and we talk about this a lot in organizing circles. It's it's the story of narrative, right? How do we tell our stories? And the reality is, so I say this to someone who studied history and theology. One of the big issues we have around racial collaboration is this: um, we don't have an accurate retelling of the story of how race works in this country uh, until we're really willing to get beyond racial categories. And really understand, you know, as I, as I wrote down the words white supremacy, what came to mind is white supremacy has only worked firing class, right, that has often served as a buffer uh, between white elites and then people of color and then other whites below them, right, until we're willing to have a real conversation about the ways that race is not a conversation just about color, but it's a real conversation about how race works to help people make money. And that's been the historic narrative of this country. And until we're willing to have that real conversation, uh, we're gonna always find ourselves at a loss for really figuring out how we build power together. I think what's so powerful about the Occupy movement is it puts into the atmosphere this kind of language around the 99% and the 1%. But then the next question becomes, how do we strategically begin to unpack who really is the 1%, right? And, and the 1% is not just a conversation about people with a whole bunch of money, but it's a conversation about a group of people who throughout the entire history of not this country, but the entire history of, of this experiment in, in, in colonialism and imperialism that has happened in this part of the world, it is a conversation about centuries worth of a small group of people being able to wield power over others. And that's just not manifested in government. That's manifested in the corporate interest that funds government. Right? I mean, and that's why when we have conversations about uh, whether we're talking about regulations around campaign reform, whether we're talking about who has access to actual political power, whether we're talking about Mitt Romney potentially becoming one of the wealthiest men in the history of this country to run for president, right? That's a real conversation not just about race and not just about locations of oppression that find themselves in concentrated poverty, but that's a real conversation about who holds the strings in this democratic project, right? And I think more often, we don't have that conversation amongst working class folks, amongst no class folks, amongst middle class folks. We consistently couch it in race battles that don't necessarily connect this to a much larger conversation about who's really benefiting. And it's not just rich folks. It's super, super, super rich folks, right? <laughs> it's not just rich folks that have you know, done well and managed to amass some type of wealth. It is people who are able to sustain their families in a type of wealth category that we can't even fathom, right? Those are the type of people we're talking about. And not to bring this into a conversation about class warfare, because that's not even what I'm, trust me, I'm all about aspiration. I'm all about people being able to provide opportunity and, and have some means to independent wealth. But the reality is this, until we have a real conversation about how the super elite have continued to put all of us against each other in many different ways, we're not going to be able to have any type of unifying conversation around race. And so I was very intrigued by that opening question around why is it that race can't make itself to the center of the conversation around the Occupy movement or any organizing movement because we're really not willing to have that brutal conversation about the ways race and structures have worked to help a very small group of people in this country.